Welcome back to Think Tech. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Global Connections, and we're going to talk to Rukmati Kandakar about the war in Ukraine and how it is raging on. Welcome to the show, Rukmati. Aloha, Jay, and thank you very, very much for having me on your show. And it's lovely to be back with you and lovely to see you again. So, you know, there have been interesting reports lately. Uh, one was a report that uh, really troubled me. There was uh, a report about how much of Ukraine has been destroyed by the Russians. An enormous amount of the infrastructure, the housing, the institutions, the hospitals, the schools, um, everything has been destroyed. And, you know, and um, they're, they're not necessarily targeting the military, the Ukrainian military. They're targeting um, this whole society. They're trying to destroy it. It's kind of genocide of the society. And it's intentional. And now they're using these glide bombs, which are very effective. They're launched from aircraft that is in Russia, and then they slide over into Ukraine and do extraordinary damage. And as much as, as Zelensky wants to have weapons to deal with them, um, the West is reluctant. Biden is still reluctant. The other, the other news is that Biden is saying, well, you know, you can use American weapons in certain ways, in certain areas, for certain purposes, under our control. And, um, you know, that, that troubles me in the sense that what is he trying to be the strategist here? Is he trying to tell Zelensky exactly what to do day by day? And the answer is probably yes. Um, and I don't think Biden has the tactician uh, experience and the strategist experience to really qualify for that. And so, as, as in the past couple of years, he's been limiting Zelensky and limiting American involvement and also worried about what the Russians will do to, um, you know, to respond. So um, those are the two things that have come to my attention. But I would like to hear your thinking and your reporting on this, Rupmati. Um, what's the situation in the war in Ukraine, which undoubtedly, unquestionably, is raging on? Yeah, Jay, two years raging on. So that's a long time uh, for them to continue this. And uh, the Russian war on Ukraine is now in, you know, four regions of Ukraine, Donetsk, Luhansk, Kherson, and Zaporizhia regions of Ukraine. So uh, now, Jay, you see uh, Russia has, there is not a full-scale invasion. There is not, a, you know, muted uh, offensive. It is a daily uh, daily news uh, feed that we get that this civilian area was bombed. And like you said, it's never military targeted. It is just randomly targeted. And uh, these four regions that we spoke about, there was a referendum held as, as to why they should be Russian territory. Then there was a next step taken where the two banks wanted to open branches to give loans to civilians and uh, defense people. So And planning to open up all over Ukraine, Russian banks. So this is kind of a takeover, a slow and steady takeover. They're getting used to the Russian presence uh, in Ukraine. And uh, like we said, uh, Ukraine has taken back 54% of what Russia uh, had come in uh, in the beginning of the war. But now Russia holds 18% of what uh, the total Ukrainian territory. So these kind of figures which we have given in the description, are very uh, complicated because there's another country which is in a sovereign country. So that is the troubling part in this. Uh, and uh, uh, the main point that you get is when Russia declared that any country whose uh, weapons are used to target Russian territory would be met with nuclear uh, offensive. And that's the same time Biden gives a provocative statement that uh, Ukraine can go ahead and use our weapons to uh, in Russian territory. So uh, the directions given by Putin or the limitations set by Putin were very clear. You can use the weapons for your defense, but not offense in Russian territory. So when Biden pushes this step a little bit further, you know, the ground situation is tense. And we've spoken about this in our topic uh, on, our, on our episodes on Israel, that this kind of um, critical junctures 
this kind of uh, rhetorics at uh, critical junctures, you know, can take the path of the war towards more aggression, towards more destruction, and it is uncalled for. Basically, it is uncalled for. Biden can cannot, you know, rightly write in this, cannot be the strategist in this area. It is a, uh, it requires a very personalized uh, and very, um, what do you say, muted answer right now because uh, you know there are so many developments taking place like you know this uh, the peace talks which are going to be held on june in june uh, 9 to 14th in switzerland so biden and uh, zelensky were very uh, aggressively uh, quoting the cis that is the commonwealth of independent states uh, which is russian uh, dominated you know kyrgyzstan all these places kazakhstan Tur turkmenistan now, Russia is very, they're very hardcore Russian, uh, what do you say, allies. You cannot bring them to the table for, they refused. So, this kind of diplomatic gestures are going to be futile, isn't it, Jay? Are you going to convince them against their master? Russia is their master, technically speaking. So, you can't bring them to peace talk and you can't use them to pressurize Russia. So, this is a failed uh, diplomatic effort. So, why waste time in this? It has that if there has to be a solution to this, see, it's a long lasting offensive. Russia is using it very uh, smartly in its economic. They've turned the table to uh, economically benefit from this. The sanctions have uh, not gotten any effect which we wanted. Russia has, in fact, moved towards de dollarization. The uh, ruble becomes more stronger. You know, uh, they're dealing, there's diplomatic efforts going on everywhere. Who suffers? America suffers when you have de-dollarization. America gets the hit of the recession or hit of the demand supply when a dollar is not used in international trade. So all these things have to be, parameters have to be kept in mind. There cannot be a narrative set that we want to control the offensive against Russia or we want to dictate terms to Russia. And really, you're turning out to be a sad kettle of fish. It's been going on two years and Russia has been pulverizing Ukraine. Um, more than a quarter of the population has, has left Ukraine, finding um, respite elsewhere and probably going to stay there. And they talk about returning, but what's there to return to? That was one of the, um, you know, the comments in that article I mentioned about, about how everything has been destroyed. Uh, rhetorically, what is there to return to? The buildings are destroyed, the schools, the hospitals, all the institutions, the the markets, they're all gone. Um, and it, it amazes me that anybody stays behind. I don't know how they live. And this has got to affect um, families. It's got to affect morale. It's got to affect the society in general. How long can they last? How long can they be strong and courageous? You know, they've already demonstrated to us they are strong and courageous, but, you know, that has got to be um, tested. It is being tested now. Uh, and, you know, he treats it, he, Putin, treats it as a, a war of attrition. He's trying to undermine it in every way. He's made uh, threats very recently to some of the other uh, former satellite countries um, to the west, north and south of Ukraine. Um, he is trying to scare everybody in the EU. And the EU has a right wing, an emerging right wing that really doesn't want to get involved in Ukraine. And uh, Putin is um, Putin is talking to them with social media. Uh, Putin is undermining, um, you know, the resolve of the EU and NATO to deal with his aggression. Um, so he's he's working this on many fronts, including social media and propaganda, um, and every way he can, and it is having an effect. And as you said, the sanctions aren't working. I don't know why we keep on beating that horse. It's not working. Uh, so I, I don't know what we can do. The only thing that Biden can do is let the Ukrainians fight as they will. They give them the weapons and say, save yourselves. But he doesn't okay. do that. Just like in Israel, he restrains them and constrains them and tells them they can't do this and they can't do that. The threat always being that if they don't listen to him, they don't follow him, he'll cut them off. He'll cut them off uh, from weapons. He'll cut them off from money. Um, and, you know, effectively, he's shackling them 
And they're losing. They're losing morale. They're losing soldiers. They're losing their infrastructure. Um, they have less and less to actually work with, deal with, um, fight for every day. And they're losing territory. And, you know, I, I think what's going to happen here, and this has got to be part of it. You know, Putin wants to help Trump. Trump oh. has promised Putin we don't know what kind of transactional arrangement they have. It's more than just a hotel in Moscow. It's something else. And it, it may be a compromise. You don't know. But uh, th those two guys have an agreement of some kind. And, and as we get closer to November, I think you're going to see that, uh, that Russia steps up its aggression. It is stepping up its aggression right now today. Um, and it's, um, you know, it's, 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 Ukraine is going to look more, more like a loser every day. And then uh, Putin and Trump will collaborate in blaming Biden for that. And that will be a factor in the election. Just as Putin helped Trump um, back in 2016, um, he's going to help, he is helping Trump now in 2024. And this is a big part of it. So I don't know what we do. Do you have any ideas about what we do? Peace talks don't seem relevant right now because, you know, you have to have a, a some leverage, and the Ukrainians really don't have much of leverage. They they're constrained by by uh, by, by Biden, and uh, they're being attacked every day by by the Russians. Uh, there was a, a a little hope this morning in in, in the paper um, about how they had used the HIMAC. Um, you know, uh, weapons to attack something like 20 miles into Russia because uh, they complained to Biden that Russian troops were amassing at the border ostensibly for another big, um, you know, invasion, another big um, maneuver into Ukraine. And so he said, okay, you can use these HIMAC weapons, um, but only in limited circumstances, only in limited areas. Um, of Ukraine and of Russia, he's he's drawing a map for them. Um, ah. So they did that, and they, and they apparently knocked off some of um, you know Russia's uh, military installations. But I don't I don't think that's going to turn the tide. What will it take to turn the tide, Rubmati? Yes, so right, Jay. Trump's election pitch right now is he'll make peace in the world. So he is the prophetic angel which is coming through. He's he's talking that way. But Jay, if we look at uh, the Russian offensive uh, in a, in a, you know um, at a vantage point and see that you know first Russia came in uh, and they wanted to stop Ukraine from joining NATO hook or hook. Then you know Putin gives the interview that you know he will uh, he would he wanted to join a NATO. So the very organization which was uh, formed to go against him, he wanted to join. So diplomatically, he comes across as such a soft person, not an aggressive person. Like you said, they destroyed all the institutions, all the civilian areas. People are leaving the place. Now what does Putin want to do? He comes in with banks. He comes in with uh, you know services that Russia can offer the Ukrainian people. He calls Ukraine as part of Russia. You know, he offers Russia to Ukraine. Nin people, as long as Ukraine does not join NATO. Now, what is standing in between his path is Zelensky, And he, does, he doesn't want uh, to join Russia. He wants to join NATO. So the leadership is against and Putin has overridden the leadership and gone to the people. He's trying to get the people to believe that they are Russians. They are one. They are more closer to Russia than, than they are closer to the West. There will come a point, Jay, when people are so fed up of this war, they will prefer to go and, you know, is not strangulate under uh, the pressures of war, but rather be with Putin and be safer and secure. That is what Putin aims for. The, you know, the time that they are taking, the time, Russia could have finished this within a couple of weeks, but they didn't do that because they want the Ukrainian people to understand that leadership, and stability under the Russian umbrella of safety is much better than being under Zelensky, where you have to, uh, you know, face aggression and war every day. It's an everyday routine kind of a thing. So, you know, there are many aspects to this. 
militarily he is blocking uh, ukraine militarily he is doing everything but like you said diplomatically also he works uh, he works uh, he's got a mind which goes two steps ahead he is a statesman politician but he's also a spy and he knows how to maneuver things jay and zelensky does he lacks that political experience to deal with these maneuvers and that's where he loses out he is busy in appealing to people for ammunition he is busy in appealing can i use these weapons on the russian front but how much offensive are you going to uh, give to the russians if you use the countries you are going to put the countries at danger us said it this you can use our weapons but no other uk said it but no other country is going to stake their weapons to go inside russian territory and then you know uh, face a direct offensive from russia so you know he is uh, treading a very uh dangerous path zelsins i know you're a, you're a chess uh, you're a chess player <laughs> and, and, uh, through you i see that uh, putin is a chess player um <laughs> and, and this is all a big chess game for him and if you watch his moves you you will know generally what his attack is you don't know what his end plan is necessarily but you know what his attack <clears throat> i guess you do know what his end plan is you just don't know where the checkmate comes i would say this um you know just as we have these failed peace talks on and on and on in the uh, in the middle east um the, the the peace talks around ukraine are going to be failed but putin will have a, a pretty good position because he's destroying the country and the people it reminds me of uh, stalin what he did in 1933 he he essentially destroyed ukraine and um putin is trying to do that he wants it he wants to take it over he wants to populate it with his his friends and the russians that he he sends in to settle it uh, you know in favor of russia so i think these peace talks uh, in ukraine could work and and they're going to wind up giving away a substantial amount of the country um and and uh, and they're going to be sitting pretty for another invasion and more attacks and it may not be kinetic attacks it may be political attacks you know puppet governments and the like because people are so dismayed you know and um, and disheartened already so if this happens you know he he putin will have achieved his goal mm -hmm. he will have essentially disrupted the society in ukraine the community the people the government um and i think you know we're not that far away from it and of course the the other hand is that this helps him in terms of um helping trump and and if trump wins trump will help him the whole thing is tra transactional but what you know what concerns me about peace talks is what do you mean peace talks this was an invasion what what kind of munich appeasement are we talking about here um this is no better than chamberlain in munich um give away the country for what is there a reason for that what i mean is if these peace talks result in what i think they're going to result in that is giving away a good part of ukraine it's the end of the liberal world order it's it's the end of the um you know geopolitical morality of not having neighbors invade neighbors and i think that's where we're going it will not be the only uh, example of this other examples will have by by will happen either by putin or others in the world who will follow his uh, who will be encouraged by his maneuvers so we're really at a very you know difficult point but let me ask you this though has the eu stayed together in accordance with its promise has the united nations stayed you know supportive in accordance with its promise and my third part of that same question is what about the media you know the, the point is this is an invasion and wow. when you have an invasion of one country against its neighbor you have got to react and respond and get together and help um, has the media followed that line has the media emphasized that point or is the media just looking from the sidelines what do you think jay uh, when you talk of media i forget all the other questions that you said because we have seen such a aggressive media in the israel uh terror attacks which happened uh, which were 
uh, done by Hamas. And, uh, you know, the way media portrayed it, it reached out to each and every house, it reached us to every device. Did this happen during Ukraine? It did not. So this kind of, uh, you know, selective media or pseudo-liberalism that media follows is so very dangerous, Jay, because uh, they don't report facts. They distort facts. And when you distort facts, you distort history. And, uh, you know, uh, when the media does not show what is actually happening in uh, Ukraine, they do not call out uh, Putin as a criminal. The ICG does not respond in the same way. The international organizations do not respond in the same way to uh, Putin's uh, uh, aggression on uh, Ukraine. The way they respond to uh, Israel's defense uh, of uh, a terror attack on their country, you know, it shows the double standards that... Uh, the media holds and European Union we have discussed before it does not take a unified stand and it does not take a strong stand so as a block it is literally a, a stagnant block and um, you know when they did not um, you know support the truth today you have these uh, incoming immigration or which has become developed into terror cells so this kind of things which will have repercussions for the future is what the European Union has neglected even within uh, European Union itself when they have neglected outside. They have not voiced their opinion. They don't have a strong, uh, you know, righteous point of view for the outside world. And the same uh, reflection they have done for internal politics. And there's a confusion in Europe right now. And why I say confusion? Because, you know, there is a phase in which Europeanization, Europeanness, Europeanness is reduced, reducing, reducing very, very, very fast. Mm. And something is going to take over very, very hard. And it's going to be internal. All these wars that we are seeing, they're external forces. Okay, we can throw them out. But when it happens from inside, that's going to be harder. Yes, so, I agree. So so many aspects to this, Jay. When Ukrainians want to move out, where will they move out? You know, they will move towards uh, Russia. Then the common Ukrainians, instead of moving to the uh, to their west, uh, they will move to Russia, which is more closer to their culture. You've seen how the migrants are uh, removed from Russia after the terror war, uh, terror uh, attack on Russia. No questions asked. In a line outside, airport outside. When migrants are removed from, say, an uh, airport in France, they rebel against the officer. Then the officer goes into a court of uh, human rights. Then the migrants' human rights are considered. What about Europe? What about Europeanness? Your culture is being destroyed. There is nothing about that. So when Russia wanted to remove, authoritarian uh, rule seemed to be more better in dealing with this kind of uh, Threats. That um, Putin is, it's not only a war of attrition, he's, he's pushing them around. He's pushing the EU and the countries of the EU around. He's manipulating their, you know, their politics, their public opinion with, uh, you know, his social media and his propaganda. And at the end of the day, you know, this undermines the EU. It undermines Europeanness. It undermines NATO. I mean, you know, you know, can you can you really think that the EU will stick together on this issue or any other issue? Do you think the uh, NATO will stick together on this issue or any other issue? He's fragmented um, the West. He's fragmented the way, fragmented the U.S. as well. Let me make a hypothetical result here. We have these phony <laughs> baloney peace talks, and he's in charge. He's at the head of the table. OK, and uh, either a, a substantial part of Ukraine is given away to him or all of Ukraine. I mean, if he can break them, if he can break Zelensky and Zelensky's government somehow, he's trying hard to do that. An assassination, for example, an assassination of people in, in Zelensky's cabinet. I mean, this is this is he's very vulnerable, Zelensky, right now. <clears throat> so if he can break Ukraine and take a good part of it or all of it, it remains that Ukraine has been physically broken. Um, its, uh, its infrastructure, its, its buildings, its power plants, 
it's dams, it's agricultural systems, uh, it's transportation, or everything, you name it, uh, has been damaged or broken. So then we have a country which is actually by landmass outside of Russia itself, it's the biggest country in, in Western Europe, arguably, uh, with a huge, a formerly huge population of 40 million plus. And so it's got to be rebuilt. We know that Putin wants to rebuild it in his own image, in the, in the Stalinesque image of 1933. Um, but who will do that? To the extent that any part of Ukraine remains Ukraine, somebody has to step in and build it. That means billions of dollars of capital and architecture, engineering, contracting efforts that could be quick or maybe not so quick. And, and then you have, assuming a line between West Ukraine and East Ukraine, the people uh. from the Donbass, um, you, you, have, <laughs> you have Putin, and he is going to rebuild it in his way. Um, <clears throat> can you compare for me how that would work? Who would step in and rebuild West Ukraine or remaining Ukraine? And how that would compare with the way that Putin builds or rebuilds um, the part that he's destroyed in the East? Yeah. Jay, he will make it as lucrative as he can. You know, it's going to be like, wow, uh, people want to move from East to West. That way he's going to make it. But Jay, well, the point uh, that I would like to make is that if Putin wanted to assassinate Zelensky, he could have done it in a matter of seconds. He doesn't want to. This prolonging of the issue is helping Russia financially so beautifully that Russia has emerged from being a uh, redundant nation to in the center of world affairs today. Oil and gas is flowing, money is coming in, you know, uh, there is trade system going on in uh, without dealing in dollars. So for them, Zelensky issue, keeping it, you know, uh, going on and on is good for them. And I'll tell you one thing very frankly, Zelensky also is not interested in closing the issue. When he calls for peace talks, he's calling the CIS nations and China. Call Russia to the table. <laughs> Invite Russia to try to bring Russia to the table. If you get its uh, satellite allies, as if they are going to pressurize Russia to uh, make peace with Ukraine. I mean, he is just beating around the bush and the bush is all around, but rather than dealing with Russia. So Zelensky also is uh, uh, at of, at fault big time and deliberately, deliberately stalling the process. He gets a lot of financial aid. Uh, you know, he uh, wants weapons of the best kind, but are they being used? Are they being, you know, is, is it going to have any effect? This, um, this stalling or this time appeasement that they have taken place, uh, taken place in this war has, who has it benefited? Has it benefited Ukrainian people? No. It has only solely benefited Russia. It is as clear as water. You know, you have to see that uh, Zelensky is the only Ukrainian who is at peace. The rest of the population is messed up with a missile coming from anywhere. You know, there's no protection under Zelensky. There, where is the NATO membership? He wants to come to the Grammys. He wants to come to the Oscars. There is no concrete leadership. And I told you at the beginning of the program, he lacks political statesmanship. He lacks political experience. It is his showmanship that is taking uh, uh, domination and spoiling Ukraine's uh, handling of the situation. Just switch places and put, put it in place. There would have been stronger diplomatic efforts. There would have been stronger military offenses, uh, offensives. Uh, you know, he is having uh, recruiting civilians uh, forcefully from their house. How do you think Ukrainian civilians feel of your people being forced into war? So it doesn't appeal to the common Ukrainian. For them, they will move towards Russia. The affiliations will move towards Russia as the time passes. We have to um, look and see how this affects larger issues, larger institutions, too. I mean, this, this is essentially a battle of East and West, and he's garnering uh, China and some of his friends uh, in Central Asia and the like. He is undermining the EU and NATO and the US. So at the end of the day, we don't know how. We can't say how it will change, but we know it will change. We know yes. the United Nations will change. It's, it's already significantly declined. 
because of many factors, but it's it's demonstrated that here as it has in, in the Middle East conflict. Um, and you know, all things considered, oh, and war crimes have become legitimized. You can do war mm -hmm. crimes and completely get away with it. And, yes. and, and people will support you and they'll go out in the streets and 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 uh, have, a, have a protest in your favor for having done the war crimes. I, you know, that's where we are now. And so, you know, we have a, the, the failure of the liberal world order, um, the failure of the notion that you shouldn't uh, invade your friends, um, the failure of Western institutions, presumably that were democratic and, you know, moral. Um, and, and we have the emergence of countries and uh, groups of countries that are on the other side of that coin. This will affect everyone. This is affecting yes. now, and we just have to keep our, our eyes peeled on that because ultimately it's going to affect everyone in the world, pro or con. What do you think? Yeah, Jay, no, no, no country will be immune to this because now it's uh, sovereignty has been threatened and ignored. That is that is the point that you, know, you just don't have your boundaries to defend you. Any country can come and attack you and the world will watch while it's happening and expect you to defend your own self with no help coming from anywhere. You know, international organizations have not come to the forefront. They have been very deliberate in keeping mute. And uh, when he's declared a war criminal, he goes to places where he has diplomatic relations, Putin. So uh, there is convenience for him. There are enough loopholes for him to uh, uh, enjoy his uh, stature as a world leader. If he's a war criminal, he cannot leave his country. He cannot visit other countries. That is has to be universal, isn't it? He can't pick and choose where to go, where not to go. And uh, Jay, uh, when he has so much influence over other countries, and you know his aggression after post Ukraine, if if there's a post Ukraine victory, it will move to other nations which are at the periphery, and he will want to dominate and dictate and annex those. He dreams of a USSR again. You know, that is his ultimate move. So, uh, you know, when you see this kind of uh, selective, um, how do you say, treatment of war criminals, or, you know, uh, they were so quick in getting to Israel for defending their own territory. And here a country has moved into another country, but still it takes so much, so long to categorize and you know label but here in israel and hamas they are very fast they're very quick the media is quick the international organizations are quick one last point is that um you know uh, in, a, in a perfect world you'd expect the leader of the free world namely joe biden um to go out and defend the free world defend democracy wherever it is um and to be very um, about that uh, to uh, use american resources and weapons to defend, you know, countries that are being attacked and countries that are victims of war crimes and the like, uh, and to and to bolster, you know, uh, the Western institutions that we have treasured since World War II, <clears throat> but he isn't doing that. Um, he's doing it in sort of in part uh, in a very modest, mild-mannered way, um, and that and that also changes things. It changes things to say that, that the notion of a leader of the United States uh, can step out um, and act as the leader of the free world. Uh, I would say that we're on a path to say that we, we do not lead the free world. Um, and there is no leader, in the, even in Europe, there's no leader of the free world. And so it's a path to you know, the violation of international order and chaos. Um, I, I, you know, and, and the problem is, why is Joe Biden not stepping up? It's because the country's not stepping up. Remember, mm -hmm. Congress hesitated for months, and it was the Republicans, of course, hesitated for months to, to um, you know, to appropriate funds to help Ukraine and Israel. Um, and so... And, and Congress is represented, represents a lot of people in this country who feel that way. And so when we say that Biden is not stepping up, we're really saying 
the country's not stepping up. He reflects the country. He's trying to reflect the country. And so the United States is not just because of Biden. It's the, the country of the United States is no longer interested in being the leader of the free world. That's a fact. Um, and, you know, instead, we're going isolationist and leaving it to others to determine the, the future of, of humankind. Don't you agree? So, so I agree so much with you, Jay. And uh, the leader of the free world, you know, he is like, he has to protect uh, the values of the free world. And when, like you said, when he's not doing it, means that America is not backing him. But Joe Biden, as a strategist, is not forceful enough. He meddles, you know, the word meddling is different from the person who directs uh, or the strategic uh, uh, maneuvering of an uh, issue. You know, Trump is out, but he's saying, I will make peace. How he'll make peace? When he came and he made Jerusalem the capital, he did uh, capital. He, uh, you know, these concrete steps that you take are very important in showing the power of a leader. And as we have seen, when it's stretching, when there is de-dollarization happening, when there is economic recession in the country, no concrete economic steps to uh, give relief to the domestic population. These two wars which are happening, you know, uh, drawing out millions and millions of dollars, billions of dollars uh, out of America when you have domestic recession. These things don't appeal to uh, the domestic population and you don't visualize joe biden as a good leader just because of these things if he had closed the war or you know he had done something concrete take this destroy or take this protect you know if you hear these concrete steps and it doesn't draw millions and millions from your bank account you feel this guy is a leader but that is not happening every time we hear this week this much has been sanctioned for ukraine this much has been sanctioned for Israel. Two different, different topics. But they're clubbed together. as Because they're drawing aid from US. And when they draw aid, Jay, the domestic population feels it's going from my pocket. So you don't have that kind of backing for the leader. You don't have that kind of appeal for that leader who can take our money and you know solve world issues. What does me, uh, being the captain of the ship entail that you guide it to safer waters? But when you sit in the storm, you know, your crew loses interest in you. So that's the only thing that happens. You know, the, Joe Biden is stretching it or uh, either don't meddle in him, right? Means ignore the problem completely. But if you're inside it, take concrete decisions. That's the only thing that is happening to you. Mm. Because when we are seeing Joe Biden middle and um, you know stagnate things at the same time we are seeing countries which are smaller which are not which were not which were not that influence on the global map taking very concrete decisions of going for de-dollarization economic corridors happening without the us so this kind of uh, you know leaving behind the hegemon of the system let me say that i think i need to go soak my head <laughs> <laughs> there's, not, there's not there's not a lot of uh, optimism in the air these days <laughs> thank you very much Rupmati Rupmati Kandakar a geopolitical analyst we really appreciate you coming on and we'll see you in a few days and we'll examine some other geopolitical issue thank you so much mm -hmm.